fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. You're back in the House of Mystery. It's KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm Al Warren. Keb Thompson is off for the week. Uh, today we are talking with a uh, incredible reporter. Um, it's quite an honor to have him here. Um, he's got a few books that are excellent books, and we're talking about the secrecy world today. And uh, joining us is uh, Jake Bernstein. Thank you for being here. No, thanks for having me on. So uh, this is a pleasure. Um, how did you get into writing secrecy world like what what led you down that road to because uh, i'm guessing that this was a lot of um just from going through the book this is a lot of work this is a lot of research a lot of contacts and because i know what it's like to write a book not like this so i could imagine so what made you take on such a big project sure it all begins with a phone call I, I got a call from uh, a friend of mine who was a uh, senior editor at an organization called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which is an amazing nonprofit uh, that uh, does collaborative journalism. They, they work with journalists, investigative reporters all over the world doing these big projects. And, uh, and he said, you know, we're just beginning to work on something that uh, I think you'll find really interesting, and I can't tell you anything about it on the phone. You're going to have to come to Washington, D.C. and meet with the director and the deputy director personally, and, and, and they will brief you. And so I went to D.C., and I met with Jared Ryle and, and his deputy, Marina Walker, and they told me that they had begun to receive this, uh, leak, these leaked documents. At the beginning, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that much, but it, it eventually turned into a torrent, and, uh, and there were 11.5 million leaked documents. And they were coming from this... Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca, and they had already identified some, some really interesting things, including the Prime Minister of Iceland and, uh, and people very close to Vladimir Putin and a lot of other interesting stuff, and they said, would you like to work on this project with us? And uh, I immediately signed on. It was sort of a fascinating look into this secret world uh, that, uh, that very few people really know about. And so I spent a, a, a wonderful year uh, working with uh, more than a hundred other journalists around the world and, and crackerjack investigative reporters from different countries um, on this project, sort of going through these documents and uh, and figuring out sort of the stories that they told and uh, and who was in who who were, who were in the documents and things like that. And we sort of published our our work or began publishing our work in April 2016. It was sort of a bombshell. Uh, that was literally heard around the world. In fact, um, I spoke with one of the, the well, both of the principals uh, behind Mossack Fonseca, this law firm that had that had their uh, their documents, uh, their database leaked. And uh, Jurgen Mossack said to me that he really began to understand the enormity of what had happened to him and his firm when he turned on the TV and his life work his life's work was literally on every single channel. So it was, it was, for a while, it was sort of inescapable. But it was also fascinating to me, and I felt like there were parts of the story that we hadn't really been able to tell adequately. And one part was, in fact, the perspective of the two principal characters, uh, Jurgen Mosek and Ramon Ponseca, uh, you know, what it was like from their perspective and, and how they saw things, and also sort of how the documents really showed the evolution of this, of this secrecy world. And, 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 and also, you know, America's sort of central role in this story. 
And so a number of things like that. And uh, I felt, you know what, I-, I need to spend some more time here. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's interesting tales to be told. Uh, we really hadn't, you know, even though we had spent a year, we had only scratched the surface of what these documents could tell us. Uh, and so I proposed this book and uh, went off on another uh, wonderful adventure. <laughs> well, <clears throat> why? One thing that struck me is, is why so many people still have not heard about the, the Panama Papers and, and just the, the law group in Panama, just the whole thing. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm talking to other news people and all this, and, and I mention it to them, and they go, well, what's that? What's that? I, I'm surprised. I mean, I think that's an excellent question, Alan, and, and, and it's part of the reason that I wrote Secrecy World. Um, you know, I think that Americans sort of think about this um, as something that happened somewhere else. And it doesn't really have very much to do with them. You know, this is, uh, you know, the, the secrecy world is all about sort of place, tax havens uh, that are, you know, tropical islands with ocean breezes and palm trees and things like that. It doesn't really relate to them. But in fact, it, it, it really does. First of all, the United States is, is probably the leading tax haven in the world. Uh, Delaware, Wyoming, Nevada, pump out hundreds of thousands of anonymous shell companies. Um, Delaware's pulling in a billion dollars a year from its public registry. And the Treasury Department and the State Department have complained bitterly that Delaware's anonymous shell companies are being used by the Russian mafia and transnational gangs and other cr- criminal elements to launder money. Um, so it's a big problem from that perspective, but it's also a problem because, you know, property uh, uh, prices in places like Seattle and Los Angeles and New York and Miami and San Antonio um, are really quite high. And part of the reason is that foreigners are using anonymous shell companies to come in and buy a property. And, you know, that might be perfectly okay, but it also is being used for money laundering, for corrupt officials to park cash um, and for other sort of nefarious reasons. And we can't tell the difference uh, because it's it's very hard to get past who's behind these anonymous shell companies. So and then finally, you know, our, our our government is 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 complaining that it doesn't have enough money for infrastructure, <laughs> for healthcare, for 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 police, you know, for education, for stuff like that. When you know, billions of dollars. I mean, uh, it's it's. Uh, you know, more than seventy billion dollars a year just from corporations uh, has been uh, has been disappearing in uh, in these in these tax havens. So that was sort of part of the reason I wrote the book is to bring it home to Americans and make them understand that you know this secret uh, underground economy through its trillions of dollars flows affects all of us all the time. Well, you know, um, people. Nowadays, it seems like their focus is on, um, you know, uh, media sort of stuff like the latest thing Donald Trump says or uh, whatever the case. They're more about the quick flash. And when they get a story like this, they can be outraged. But then the next thing that comes across their phone takes over like this isn't going deep into people. And I and I don't know why. That's what's confusing to me. Um, do they just not understand what's happening here with the, with the fake shell companies and, and what's really going on? I think part of it is, is the fact that it is so secret. I mean, there's, there's, there, this is all by design, right? I mean, uh, people are, are using this system of secret bank accounts and uh, tax havens and anonymous shell companies and trusts and foundations um, to hide their financial activities, uh, you know, to keep it out of view. And so that makes it very hard uh, to see what is in fact happening. And, and, and that's why these, these leak investigations that uh, uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists have done have been so important because really for the first time they have given us sort of a macro view of, of how this world works um, and who the players are. Um, I mean, ultimately with the Panama Papers, uh, more than 140 politicians from more than 50 countries were identified. 
Um, you know, there were more than 21 tax havens uh, that, uh, that that were were featured in, in the paper. So, uh, you know, we begin to see how prevalent this is uh, and that it's like an octopus. It's got tentacles uh, everywhere. And I think, I think it, the fact that it's been, you know, something that happens underground, you know, in this secret world, is, is a big part of the reason why it hasn't really penetrated the consciousness of, uh, of most Americans. So now, maybe um, give a, a, a quick explanation of what uh, and how um, people get away with um, creating shell companies, what they do, and how they can launder money. Like, how's, how's the little system go? So if you and I have a lot of money and a and, and money to kind of hide, what, what do we do? Sure. I mean, that's, that's a great question. First of all, we need to say that, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not illegal to have a shell company, right? And there are legitimate reasons why one might want a shell company. Um, say you have uh, business activities uh, that you don't want your, your business partners to know about. You know, that might be one reason to do it. Maybe you're worried about being kidnapped and you don't want uh, the kidnappers to know, you know, the full menu of your assets. Um, or maybe you're working in multiple jurisdictions and it just makes sense to base your uh, activities in a, in a jurisdiction uh, that has low ta- low or no taxes. I mean, there's, there's lots of different reasons, right? And, and that's all perfectly uh, fine, right? But what's interesting is that since the publication of the Panama Papers, worldwide tax authorities have collected half a billion dollars in unpaid taxes, right? So clearly, the system is being used for for tax evasion in a big way, um, and uh, and there's lots of different ways to do that. I mean, if you have uh, money that uh, that you want to launder or that you don't want um, people knowing about, you could say set up a, a, an offshore company in the British Virgin Islands or in Panama or in Cyprus. And someplace like that, and they could set up a bank account, and then you could get the money into the bank account, and the bank account could then, uh, you know, the, the offshore company could then buy an asset uh, here, say an apartment or, or, or a car or something like that, and then lease it back to you. Um, I mean, there's different sort of ways that you can play the system to, to sort of hide your activities, and the people who are really good at it, uh, they layer their... Um, their, their, their entities, right? So you don't just have an offshore shell company. You have a foundation and a trust. I mean, I have a, in, in, in the book, I, I actually talk about uh, a Mexican gentleman who wanted to buy an apartment, uh, a house actually, in Seattle for his sister. And the house was about a half a million dollars. His sister was uh, involved in a divorce at the time. And he didn't want the husband to find out about the house because he didn't want the the house to be part of the divorce proceedings. So he set up a Delaware company, um, and the Delaware company was going to buy the house. But the problem was is that he would be listed uh, as as the member, as the the person who was behind the Delaware company. And so what Mosaic-Lonseca suggested was create a Panamanian foundation. We will put our employees as the people behind the foundation. The foundation will in turn own the company, which will in turn own the house. And so it'll be impossible to figure out exactly, you know, who owns the house because you will, you'll end up at the foundation and the foundation, the only people you'll see with the foundation will be these employees of Mosaic on Seca. So there's all kinds of reasons why you might do this. Some of it might be money laundering. I mean, the U.S. Treasury estimates that about $300 billion a year is laundered through the United States. And the U.N. thinks that it could be as much as $2 trillion laundered worldwide. So that's a lot of money. A lot of it's going through tax havens and uh, secret bank accounts. And, and some of it's you know being laundered in other ways. It's being laundered through Bitcoin or things like that. So we, we really don't have um, an idea of the amount that's really going on, like we, I mean, we have a, a an idea, but we do, we could never really figure it out because they, they hide these. Like we can't, if you approach Panama or you approached a lot of these places that do this, they're, they're not going to give us the information, are they? 
this is precisely why the IRS uh, has so much trouble, is that uh, you know t- these jurisdictions do not share their information. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a real problem to sort of figure out what's going on. And, and, and yet, you know, President Obama said something quite interesting when the Panama Papers came out. Uh, he had a press conference, and, and he was asked about this stuff. And he said, you know, we're never going to eliminate illicit finance altogether, right? It's always going to continue, but we shouldn't make it easy. And what's happened is it's really been made easy. And part of the reason it's been made easy is because the mega wealthy and corporations keep this, these, 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 these highways of, of cash open because they use this system and they want the, 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 uh, the, the secrecy and they want the anonymity you know, the, so that they can operate. But underneath that, you know, the criminals take advantage of it as well. So, you know, with, with this whole th- system going on, it almost r- runs separately than who we put in as government. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. <laughs> You're, I mean, it, there are powerful lobbies at work, right? So, for example, the Obama administration had a rule that they, that they prop, prop, promulgated um, to try to make it harder for banks um, to, to, uh, to, you know, for anonymous shell companies to, to open accounts, right? Because the banks had to find out who the beneficial owner was, the, the person who was actually behind the, the company. And uh, it took several years for them to pass this rule. And, and in the end, they, what they end up passing is, is fairly watered down, and some people argue kind of worse than, than, than the status quo that existed. Well, well, why did that happen? It happened because... The secretaries of state, you know, the secretary of state of Delaware and of Nevada and other places like that, lobbied fiercely, you know, to make sure that the that it was uh, that it was not a strong rule. And the lawyers lobbied to, to keep the because they have an interest in keeping this the system the way it is, and the bankers do as well, right? So there's 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 a lot of vested interest here, and it you're right, it transcends Democrats and Republicans. Um, it's, it's a function of, of, of how our, our, our political system works at the moment. And then the other thing that, that really, and I talk about in Secrecy World, my book, and, and it, it, the, the Panama Papers and, and the subsequent leak investigation, the Paradise Papers, really underscores is, is that there is a subset of, of the mega wealthy, you know, the truly, uh, you know, people who have $50 million or more, who, who, who increasingly don't see themselves tied to a, a specific country. You know, they'll have a house in London and they'll have a house in New York and they'll, they'll travel in, in, on private jets and they'll send their, their kids to school abroad and uh, they, might, might, they might make money in the United States. They might be born here, but they don't have the same allegiance to uh, the country uh, that, uh, that people, uh, wealthy people in the past might have, right? It's almost like a transnational uh, oligarchy. And they use this system you know, they are the, the, the principal beneficiaries of this system. Um, and that's changed, uh, you know, with growing inequality and, uh, and, 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 uh, and the fact that the, the system has become so prevalent. Is, uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of new, I think. So what's going to come of this? <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty big question. But where do you see this heading now? I think it's a really good question, and and, uh, and and one of the things that you see in Secrecy World uh, and in the Panama Papers, I mean, one of the reasons I, I wrote the book is because the, the Mossack Fonseca started in the mid 1980s, um, but there are actually companies that are much older than that in the data, and and you can see over you know decades how this system has evolved. Uh, it's almost like a living organism, right? I mean, it it, it sort of mutates to. Uh, to, to, to fight off efforts to rein it in and, uh, and, and to, to, to continue um, uh, uh, how, it, how it operates. So I think that's happening now. I mean, I think that because of, of the, of, frankly, of the bad press, um, uh, as a result of these leak investigations, some jurisdictions uh, like uh, the BVI or Jersey or other places like that are sort of upping up you know, are, are sort of uh, increasing their, their, their vetting, their due diligence, 
um, demanding more information about the uh, ultimate beneficial owners behind these uh, entities. Um, and so you see things moving a little bit more to uh, to places that are more opaque, like Dubai or Singapore, stuff like that, you know, jurisdictions like that. The other thing is that what Mossack Fonseca was trying to do was kind of be McDonald's of the offshore system, right? The, their business model was high volume, low cost which made perfect sense when they started in the mid-1980s because really all you needed to do was you created an anonymous shell company. You didn't ask too many questions about who who was the beneficial owner of it or what it was being used for. And then you just put the piece of paper in a file and you forgot about it for a year until it was time to invoice the, 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 the lawyer or whoever and set it up, you know, to renew the company. But increasingly there was more due diligence and more vetting that was required and it became more expensive to do it. And, and so this, 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 this idea of, of being high volume, low cost kind of broke down a little bit. And increasingly we're seeing that uh, this system is, is uh, the bar to entry is higher. So it's not merely, it's not the merely rich who can use the system uh, yeah. efficiently. It's, it's, the, it's the uber wealthy. And so I think that's another change that, that, is, that has happened over time. So uh, the, the law group in Panama, the Mosaic uh, Fonseca, they, they started with just, like you, you explained that in the book, um, they really started with nothing, uh, two guys, and turned it into a huge uh, operation. What do you, what do you, what do you know about the, those two guys, and what was special about them that that w helped them create such a, a a system? Boy, that's a good question. I mean, part of it was timing, right? Which is I mean, every business success story to some degree is timing, right? And and they just they were they, they hit the, a time when there was you know new wealth in the developing world in places like Brazil and and China, and, and, and they just they hit that perfectly. And, and it was also because of computerization, computerization and things like that, it was possible to, uh, to do a business uh, at this scale. But uh, the other part of it was, in fact, what you put your, your finger on, which is these two guys were kind of exceptional, right? Jurgen Mosak is a fascinating character. His father was uh, literally a Nazi. He was a member of the SS uh, in the Hitler Youth, um, and after the war, he, he's actually captured by U.S. intelligence, uh, and, uh, and and they try to turn him, perhaps, uh, to, to rat on his uh, uh, his, his fellow uh, ex-SS members. And eventually, uh, his father moves the family to Panama, and Jurgen is is is, uh, is is a young boy. He doesn't speak any English or any Spanish, um, and the family becomes uh, very, um, you know. They become very self-reliant on each other and uh, and very secretive. I think in part probably because of his father's past. So he's got the you know the immigrant zeal to uh, to succeed um, and, and that ambition, but also sort of a natural sort of secrecy that I think was tailor made for this kind of business, right? And his partner uh, Ramon Fonseca actually starts out as quite the idealist. He's a student leader. Um, his father, uh, his, his grandfather, was uh, was one of the, sort of the founders of, 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 of modern Panama in some way, and uh, and he originally wants to become a priest. Ramon Fonseca does. Um, he falls under the sway of this sort of very charismatic, um, in the sense of of, uh, of, of popular and, uh, and 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 and, and likable uh, priest who's doing work with the poor in Panama, and then gets. Uh, Kidnapped and, and killed and murdered by the by the military, um, and uh, and Ramon goes to the, to the he joins the UN in Switzerland and he blames the United Nations for kind of squelching his idealism, <laughs> and he comes back to Panama and uh, and and sort of wants to make money and uh, and and wants to sort of turn his attention to, uh, to being successful in business. And so he ends up partnering up with, with, with Jurgen Mosak, and, and, and together the two uh, become a very potent combination. And then they're, they're, they're willing to really push the envelope. So in, in the mid-1980s, uh, you know, Panama, Panamanian shell companies uh, start to gain a, a, a bad uh, reputation because of Noriega and because, 
there's there's a lot of sort of dr drug trafficking going on around uh, the, the Panamanian financial system. So they go to the British Virgin Islands, which is just past past a, a company and corporation law that is actually modeled on the Delaware Incorporation Law, and, uh, and and they're one of the first people to popularize the British Virgin Islands. Um, and uh, and other people follow them after that, but the British Virgin Islands becomes such a big player in this in this secrecy world uh, that in China, uh, for a long time, they refer to anonymous shell companies not as anonymous shell companies, but as BVIs, short for the British Virgin Islands, because everyone uses you know companies from the BVI. So I mean, these guys were innov innovators, um, but. You know, ultimately, the business model that they created could not keep up with the change in reality. I mean, I asked Jurgen Mosak at one point if he had ever seen that uh, famous uh, I Love Lucy episode where Lucy is in the chocolate factory uh, <laughs> trying to keep up with the conveyor belt as it's moving faster and faster. And he had, in fact, seen it. And, uh, and, and it, it sort of became like that for Mosak Fonseca. Increasingly, these jurisdictions started to ask questions about the shell companies, uh, about the people behind the shell companies that that they were selling, and uh, and they couldn't answer those questions. And when they tried to find out that information, you know, the, the the lawyers and the bankers and the accountants for whom they had set up the companies wouldn't provide that information, and you know, it, it eventually became untenable. Can we expect any changes to come in through the governments that we put in? Um, and I don't like to uh, bring out politics too much, but. I think it. I think it applies to this. So when we put in a, a president such as we have now, uh, is he going to do anything about something like this? Well, I mean, this president, I would well, say yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, I, I found, uh, and I and I have a chapter in Secrecy World uh, about this. Um, I found mention of uh, at least nine foreign business partners of Donald Trump's um, who are in the Panama Papers. And, uh, and they're involved in all kinds of uh, alleged bad behavior, which range from tax evasion to prostitution to bribery in West Africa. Um, and, uh, and Donald Trump himself admitted on the campaign trail that he has 515 companies, including 378 from Delaware. So he is a practice user of, of, uh, of this uh, secrecy world. Um, a lot of real estate people are. Um, and, uh, and ironically, uh, the tax uh, uh, bill that was just passed in, in many ways uh, incentivizes uh, companies and, uh, indi and individuals uh, to use these kind of anonymous shell companies. So I think at the moment, uh, we're, we're actually heading in, in, in the wrong direction as far as uh, transparency and, uh, and reigning in the abuses uh, from the secrecy world. So in a, in a way... Um, at the moment, um, current government or administration is kind of working uh, for something like this. They're not wor really working against it because they're very rich themselves. I'm afraid so. I mean, I, I think it's, it's 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 not just that that you know there are lots of you know there are billionaires and and and, and, and mega wealthy people both uh, in the Trump administration and and, uh, and in Congress, um, you know, who are uh, uh, inclined um, to to keep these uh, these perks uh, open and thriving uh, for themselves, and in fact, uh, in the in the second leak, uh, the Paradise Papers, uh, there were uh, political donors for both Democrats and Republicans, as well as several of uh, Trump's cabinet members, including the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. Um, so yes, I mean, I think I think that's 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 a big part of. Um, of, of why they, uh, you know, they want to keep this uh, this system uh, in place and thriving. And then, you know, you have all these vested interests, you know, the lawyers and the secretaries of state and, and the bankers and, and all of that. I mean, it's really only going to change when, when people start uh, demanding it, and they're only going to really start demanding it when they make the connection between the fact that, you know, our, our bridges are crumbling and, and our schools don't have heat. And uh, and, there, and and we can't afford enough police and things like that. And they make the connection and go, hey, part of that reason is because uh, you know there's this rampant tax avoidance and tax evasion that's going on, and uh, and we're not doing anything about it. 
Yeah, it's 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 crazy. And, and you mentioned Delaware a lot. So Delaware um, is really. It, it, I, how do you explain Delaware and what they do? How's that? I mean, Delaware. It, it's been you know they they've been doing this for for a long time. What's and I, I talk about this in Secrecy World, the history of Delaware. And when 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 they first passed their corporation law, they're they're actually very worried about the power of corporations. And uh, and they they won't you, you can't actually form a corporation in Delaware without a judge agreeing to it or an act of the legislature, you know, because they recognize that the, the, this is this is uh, uh, could be a, a real font for abuse. And and then we get to the point today where basically anyone can form a, a Delaware corporation for any reason and, and give very little information. Um, and so you know they've, they've come a long way. But it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a thriving business. It, you know, as I said, it brings in a billion dollars a year, um, just creating, a, you know, Delaware uh, entity. So it's, uh, you know, they, they, they do not want to change it, and, uh, and, and, they, and, they, and they fight it, uh, you know, they fight any efforts to impose transparency on them uh, tooth and nail. And, um, and that's bipartisan, it's sort of Democrats and Republicans. And so that's, you know, but what's so fascinating, and, and I get into this in secrecy world, is that the rest of the world kind of modeled what they do on Delaware. So the BDI, you know, their corporation law is sort of based on Delaware, and Panama's corporation law <laughs> is based on Delaware. And, and then the other piece of this, and, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you'll allow me, because I, it's sort of fascinating. Oh, yeah. And that really under, underscores how... How, how involved the United States is in, in all of this involves something called bear shares. And these are fascinating things. These are actually certificates. They're pieces of paper. And whoever physically holds the piece of paper owns the company. And governments hate this, right, because it's sort of tailor-made for money laundering, right? If, if I have a company and the company has a bank account um, or a house or whatever – and I give you, and the, and the company is owned by a bear share, and I give you the piece of paper, the bear share, then you own the, comp, the, the, the house. You own the bank account, right? And so it's very hard to track, you know, completely un, not transparent. And governments hate it, right? So uh, they have been, you know, governments have been trying to, 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 to crack down on bear shares for a long time, and it's worked. You know, uh, slowly but surely, uh, countries have either – Forbidding bear shares with their their shell companies, or they've demanded that they be put under custodianship, which means that the piece of paper, the certificate, has to be in a safe, you know, in a lawyer's office or a banker's office, and then that lawyer or banker is responsible for knowing who is the actual owner of the company, right? So there are only two jurisdictions left in the world, really, that allow bear shares. One is the Marshall Islands, and the other is Liberia. <laughs> now. Where are the public registries of the Marshall Islands and Liberia based? Not actually in the Marshall Islands or Liberia. They're based in New York and Virginia. <laughs> That's where the, the public registries are run out of. So it's really the United States and the United Kingdom, you know, England, that, uh, that are setting the rules for the system and that are allowing it to continue to operate uh, as it does. They are the biggest players in this secrecy world. Well, now I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I mean, it's, you, you, it, this is this is why people need to be aware of it, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be this way. We just have to have the imagination uh, to, uh, to to want to change it and uh, and to start demanding better from our public officials. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's in desperate need. Um, uh, now that uh, the two lawyers, Mosaic and uh, Fonseca, how, how are, what's going on with them now? I know that I heard that they had got arrested for some problem uh, a while back. What what's happened to them? I mean, there are a number of criminal investigations swirling around them. They were arrested and uh, and detained uh, as uh, potential flight risks for uh, almost two months, but have been released. Um, the, the leak investigation kind of destroyed their law firm. Uh, so uh, originally they, I mean, at their height, they had about 600 employees um, and offices all over the world. And now I think it's down to about 80 employees. 
Um, and uh, they can't actually just close up shop entirely because they still have all these companies out there and you just can't turn off the lights and walk away from that. You know, you have to figure out who's behind those companies and what's going on and, 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 and respond to, to inquiries from, from governments all over the world. But they're keeping a very low profile. Um, and, and, and I think they're, they're quite, you know, quite bitter in some ways. Um, you know, in part because they really do believe that, you know, Panama is is uh, is a small player in this. You know that the U.S. is 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 the biggest player, and that uh, and that it, and the U.S. has ultimately been the biggest beneficiary of their demise. Um, I mean, the reality is is that they were only one of the top four or five uh, company uh, companies that were were doing these kinds of uh, uh, corporations that are on the shell companies, and uh, and there's lots of other firms that have continued to do this business. Um, and so, uh, and they feel kind of like they were, were, were scapegoated in some way. Uh, but it remains to be seen whether, in fact, uh, you know, there will be a successful criminal prosecution against them. Um, they, of course, claim that they did nothing uh, illegal, um, and uh, and and it, uh, you know, it, it, it is yet to be determined, uh, you know, who's right uh, on that on that on that score. If something happens to them, what happens to all those companies that they've uh, shelled? Like, does 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 anything bad happen to those people that have shelled through them? Through them? I mean, this is a this is a this is a this is a great question. I talk about this uh, a lot in, in in my book, Secrets of the World. You know, there's there, there's a there's a wonderful um, debate that I found. Uh, in, uh, in, in the Panama Papers between uh, Mossack Fonseca and the Swiss bank UBS, you know, where uh, at a certain point, you know, Mossack Fonseca approaches UBS and says, well, you know, we're being leaned on by all these jurisdictions where we do business. Uh, we need to know more information about who's behind these, uh, these shell companies that you asked us to create for you, for your clients. And the banker at UBS gets all indignant and says, well, you need to know that information. We don't. Um, it's, it's, but, and Mossack Fonseca goes, but, but you asked us to create the companies. You actually, we invoiced you, and then you marked the companies up before you sold them to your clients. You know, it's not on us. And, uh, and, and the banker is still indignant, uh, threatens to report them to the Swiss authorities for money laundering. And, uh, and eventually they work out some kind of arrangement, you know, where, where, uh, where, where they won't really ask some questions and, and, uh, you know, that sort of smooth it over. But it, it, it becomes sort of like a hot potato, right? Nobody wants to take responsibility for how these companies are being used. Um, and, uh, and that's what's made it so difficult for most Exxon Seca today is, is that they're going back to these lawyers and accountants and, and bankers uh, who they set these companies up for and saying who was the, the real owner of these companies. And uh, in many cases, the lawyers, bankers, and accountants are just ignoring it. You know, because they're not the registered agent for the company, so they can kind of skate past that. But I mean, as I said, but there are tech. This data now is in the possession of, of, of several countries, uh, Germany in particular, and uh, there's there there are tax authorities that are actively looking at it and uh, and starting to to really try to figure out who who are behind these companies and uh, and whether they owe taxes and and whether they're involved in illegal activity, but. Even with 11.5 million documents, um, it's still just one company. You know, it's still you know uh, you know just one small piece of this larger world. Wow, um, just amazing. Um, now, I was looking at some of uh, your other books too. I just want to mention that you your one book called Vice. Um, so that was kind of about um, the vice president for George Bush. Yes, it was, a, it was a biography of Dick Cheney uh, that I wrote with, uh, with a colleague um, in 2006, uh, which, uh, which was fascinating. I mean, uh, I think Dick Cheney is, is actually somebody who deserves uh, uh, a sort of Robert Caro-style uh, treatment. You know, Robert Caro is an extraordinary uh, uh, journalist and uh, biographer who's written a multi uh, uh, multi uh, the part uh, biography of uh, President Johnson, and uh, uh, I think that uh, that uh, 
Cheney deserves a, a similar approach. I mean, this is a guy who was the youngest chief of staff in the history of our country um, in, in the Ford administration, and then really was a, a major player in in uh, in the U.S. government uh, up until uh, you know the end of the Bush administration. And uh, he's um, he's uh, he's a fascinating, uh, very interesting you know character who was involved in, in lots of different things. So uh, this was just a a, 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 a stab at that. Uh, it was just a, a one volume, uh, uh, relatively quick biography about Dick Cheney called uh, Vice: The Hijacking of the American Presidency. Yeah, I, w- I was going to say because you know. It- a lot of people considered him like that shadow president, and uh, and he was certainly unpopular um, in the public. I mean, he 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 had an extraordinary he had extraordinary power, particularly in the first term of the Bush administration, um, yeah, Bush two, uh, George W. Bush. And in the second term, his power started to wane a little bit, um, yeah, and by the end, uh, he had been somewhat eclipsed. Uh, but uh, but yes, I mean he was uh, an operator par excellence. I mean he he uh, like I said he he had been at the very highest level of the government since, since he was in his early 30s, and and uh, and and so really knew you know how to manipulate the levers of power in a way that uh, I think uh, very uh, very few politicians uh, American politicians have. Just amazing. Well, this has been incredible. I really enjoyed it. Um, we have your books up on the website, as well, oh, great. as well as your picture. Um, <laughs> what's next for 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 Jake? I am working on uh, several different projects, and I look forward to being able to talk more about them in the near future. Um, at, at the moment. Uh, it's a little bit too early, but uh, but they promise to be very exciting. Yeah, secret. You better watch it. They'll they'll. Be, <laughs> yeah, they're watching, they're watching, they're listening, and they they know everything. So you know, I, I know. I see these. Movies. Hopefully, not everything. Well, <laughs> but it is, it is. You know, it is. I think. I think one of the things that uh, you know the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers do tell us is that uh, there are many secrets that don't stay secret forever. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's. I think it's true. Um, as soon as uh, you know, you share anything, and uh, it doesn't take long. You know, so someone's always talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, now, the book we've been talking about is Secrecy World, and our guest is uh, Jake Bernstein. I want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.